Welcome everybody to episode 61 of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, James Murphy, aka Murph, and you can find me everywhere on social media at Murph's underscore Boston ST, where the S st- where the ST stands for Sports Talk. How are you doing on this fine, fine hump day? I mean Wednesday, you know that I love to play that joke every single time that it is the middle of the week. Hopefully your week is going good so far. Between Monday and today's episode, you've had a great couple of days. Good weather here in the New England area. What is going on, folks? Hopefully you're having a great day. Stressful day, I would say, since today is game six of the, I guess it's not really Eastern Conference because the, the division and conferences were kind of mixed up a little bit, but the game six of the second round for the Boston Bruins And we have so much to dive in about that. I mean, you all have heard my Game 5 breakdown after Monday. uh, Monday's Game 5 on Murph's Boston Sports Talk for Episode 60. today. And I kind of gave a little preview about Game 6. But today, we're just going to be talking about Game 6, really. And then I also want to get into a Celtics topic later on that surfaced today about a player on the team that wants to mutually part ways and basically... Go their separate ways, right? You know, get traded or, you know, released, waived, uh, whatever it may be. So we'll talk about that player in a little bit. But like I said, right now it's all about the Bruins. But before we talk any more about the Bruins or even the Celtics, I would like to ask you to please download, listen, and enjoy every single episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk as that is greatly appreciated. And if you are listening on YouTube, please like the video if you enjoyed this episode. Please comment down below any thoughts, opinions, comments, concerns, anything of the such. And if you're new to the channel or have not considered subscribing, please hit that big red subscribe button as that would also be greatly appreciated. With all the pleasantries, all the nitty gritty out of the way, let's talk about the Boston Bruins where their life is on the line tonight as we go to enemy territory, to the state of New York, to Nassau Coliseum to play against the red hot New York Islanders who are currently up three games to two on your Boston Bruins. It is not a good spot to be in at this given moment because the Islanders have stolen home ice back, obviously, with game four and them winning it. It is now a best of two, or I'm sorry, best of three series. And they won game five. A crazy game five, which I'm not going to get into. uh, Up and down and all around. And I, oh my God. You either win tonight. Or you die trying. I've been saying that since yesterday when I thought of it. Win tonight. Or I want dead bodies on the ice trying to do so. You have 20 guys on the active roster for, I guess, game six, right? I either want those bodies alive and celebrating a game six victory. Or I want them dead on the ice trying There is no room for mistake. There is no room for error. You have to win this game in order to extend your season. Get Game 7 back to Boston so you have another chance to win in advance. However, I'm not even going to talk about Game 7. I'm not even going to think about Game 7 because right now I don't care about that game. It doesn't matter to me. It is not important to me right now, nor should it be to you. All that matters is the game that we have in 37 minutes. I'm recording this at 6.53 p.m., just a little over a half hour away from the game. I want to try to jam in the whole episode so I don't have to go back and forth so I can get this out there to you before the game starts. So if this episode is a little shorter or a little quicker, I do apologize. But, you know, it just is what it is. The Islanders are in the best position possible. They have they did not have home ice this series. They split in Boston. Okay, yeah, they split in New York too but they were able to win the most pivotal game of the series to this point, which was game five to go up three games to two and avoid elimination or at least avoid an elimination game, right? Bruins have all the adjustments to make. They have to stop the Islanders and relatively speaking, they have, you know, when you look at how the game has been playing five on five, the Bruins are the better team. The Bruins only mess up when they commit Dumb penalties, putting the Islanders on the power play, putting your team on the penalty kill. And that's where they make their magic happen. The Bruins outscored the Islanders in game five, three to two, when it was five on five, even strength, full strength hockey. Take away every single uh, power play, 
Three to two. Bruins win. Now, I understand one or two penalties will come up throughout the course of the night just from natural play of the game, right? I'm not going to, you know, hound on that stupid Sean Corrali slashing call. But, like, yeah, there's just dumb penalties that these people hit, you know, cross-checking or just, you know, tripping, you know, slashing even. These are just like, come on, you guys can control these things. You're better than this. You know, we were talking in the Capital Series, they got, you know, too many men on the ice penalties. Patrice Bergeron flipped a puck into the crowd. That's a delayed game, two-minute minor. These are stuff, things you can control. And the Bruins right now control their destiny. It is 20 skaters, uh, a handful of coaches and assistant coaches, trainers, whatever, against the entire state of New York, pretty much. Nassau Coliseum is going to be slammed with Islander fans hoping to extend their season, hoping to extend the life of Nassau Coliseum to one more round in advance to the conference finals against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now, I mentioned this on Monday's episode after Game 5. And I was also talking to Kim about it during the game when it looked really, really bleak about us winning that game. Bruins have been in this situation before. They've been down 3-2 to two going into enemy territory, most recently during the 2019 Stanley Cup Finals. They went to St. Louis with their life on the line after losing Game 5, and they won. They won that game to extend the series to a Game 7. Obviously, the Game 7... Didn't work out, but you know what? Like I said, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to think about the Game 7. All I care about is Game 6. So it's possible. It's damn right possible for them to do this. I have full faith that they can. But something that the Bruins have been lacking is making adjustments in the middle of the game. You know, you see the Islanders making in-game adjustments, switching, you know, a forward here and there with, you know, lines 2 and 3 or whatever, or their center with, you know, line 1 and 3, whatever it may be. You know, I'm not going to go into their whole you know, adjustments, right? Bruce Cassidy needs to do a better job at making those in-game adjustments. See and feel the flow of the game. Your second line isn't doing all that good against their fourth line. Okay, put the third line in or the first line in out there or whatever. You know, try to get that second line because that second line is so critical. You cannot rely on your first line to score every single time and the Bruins have been reliant on them, which feels like, you know, the past three games. You know, you can even argue game two as well. You just have to go out there, feel the game, see the game, make the proper adjustments. If you have to move things around and shake things around mid-game, do it. If you find yourself down a skater for a line due to injury or whatever, you have to make it work. Now, obviously, losing Sean Corrali, uh, no, I'm sorry, Curtis Lazar in Game 5 was a big blow because you had to have wingers double, double shift. And obviously, losing Brandon Carlo in Game 4 it was. So, obviously, you have defensemen double shifting and such, and that just makes you a little bit more vulnerable. I understand that, but the best coaches and the best teams adjust, make changes, and work with what you got, and obviously the Bruins' defensive core is going to be a huge question mark going into the offseason whenever their season ends, regardless if it's tonight, but potential game seven, or at some point in the next round if they get that far. You have to evaluate the defensive unit because you cannot rely on Charlie McAvoy, you can't rely on Brandon Carlo, Matt Grizzlick every single time. I mean, whether it's due to injury reasons or just because of work overload. You need to have a solid, deep defensive core. Now, you could always point and say, like, oh, well, you had Zdeno Chara. You could have kept him. Yes, you can make that argument, sure. But ultimately, in the whole grand scheme of things, I think moving on from Zdeno Chara was the right business decision. You had a good group of young defenders that were ready to go. Maybe they weren't as ready as you thought. You know, injuries start to pile up. It's, you know, GMs don't have a crystal ball. You know, you went out the trade deadline, you brought in Mike Riley, you made the proper adjustment at the time that you thought was necessary. Love the Mike Riley trade. You can say that he's been playing well. You can say that he's been playing poorly. Say whatever you want. But ultimately, bringing him in was exactly what you needed at that time. Bringing in Taylor Hall has been the best trade, I think, in Bruins' like past 10 years. Was bringing him in to bring that second line to life, give it some meaning. But as of late, that line has been quiet. And, you know, Craig Smith has been dealing with a little injury. David Krejci has been pre- uh, playing pretty solid. And Taylor Hall has been kind of quiet. You cannot rely on that first line. You need at least three three lines. Four obviously would be ideal if you can get all four of them going. And speaking of the forwards, with Curtis Lazar being out for this game due to injury, Jake DeBrusque has been re uh, elevated back into the starting lineup. 
bumping uh, Nick Ritchie down to the fourth line where Jake DeBrusque would fill in back on the third line. So that third line is going to look like DeBrusque, Coyle, and Carson Kuhlman, while the fourth line will look like Nick Ritchie, Sean Corrali, and um, Chris Wagner. I think Nick Ritchie kind of more belongs on the fourth line just the way he plays. I mean, offensively, he's been quiet. He's been kind of slow, but he is a big hitter. He can kind of go in there and get dirty for you if need be. I think he just kind of serves a better purpose on the fourth line. Hopefully with Jake DeBrusque back, you know, had a game off due to getting benched. Maybe that kind of sparks a little plug under his ass. Who knows? But we need three lines to play and execute very well because otherwise Bergeron, Marchand, and Pasternak will get burnt out and you will lose if you just rely on them. Speaking on relying, or yeah, speaking of relying on someone, Tuka Rask. Just, I'm going to say the name. What are you thinking of when I say Tuka Rask? Whatever it is, let me tell you this. Tuka Rask, starting game six. So I tweeted during game five on Monday that Tuka Rask was pulled because he sucked. He faced 16 shots and he gave up four goals. Sucked, right? But we all know that he's been dealing with a little back injury. Some people are starting to speculate it's a potential hip injury. This is kind of dating back to early in the series. Obviously, he was injured a little bit and missed some time during the uh, end of la, bleh, the end of the regular season. A lot of people wanted Swayman in tonight. And I kind of mentioned, you know, the end of uh, episode 60 on Monday that if you put in Swayman to start game six, that could shatter his mentality, his ego, his confidence, and all that if he sucks and gets blown out. Going into game six, an elimination game in enemy territory, in New York out of all places, and he puts up a stinker, is not good. Just going into that kind of environment, that situation as a rookie goalie with only 20 minutes of playoff experience is asking so much. Say what you want about Tuka Rask. At least he has the experience of being in that hostile environment, facing elimination. Yes, he's failed us at times, but Tuka Rask is more equipped for the situation with experience, with the hopefully the mentality, but his health is is a big question mark. If his back, hip, or whatever the hell is going on with him is not right, then I don't want him playing at all. I don't want a 75% Tuka Rask out there because Jeremy Swayman has played very well during the regular season when he was in there. I think he was like 7-3 and three or something like that, or 7-3-1. and one. Both home and away, he's proven that he can play. Now, obviously, the Stanley Cup playoffs, different, different animal than the regular season. Yes, I understand that. But if Tuka Rask isn't right, you need to make the move. You you can't put yourself in that position to be vulnerable. Not just Tuka, but your team. If you don't have a 100% goaltender. Teams make changes all the time to their goalie, and I'm not sure why Bruce Cassidy isn't making that change or hasn't made one already. I mean, look at the Islanders, for example. I mean, they had Varlamov, then they went to Sorokin, then they went back to Varlamov. It's just, it happens. I've been a big fan of Tuka Rask. For the majority of the time. You know, he did let us down in Game 7 of the 2019 Finals. Yes. He let us down last year when he quit on the team during the bubble. Yes. And predominantly throughout this playoffs, or this uh, the playoff run, he's been playing very well. You know, he sucked in Game 5. He was okay in Game 4. And he won you Game 3. And he wasn't that good in Game 2 either. But you know what? We're not going to just backtrack. We're not going to look at this. We're not going to look at that, right? A lot of people want Jeremy Swayman. A lot of people want Tuka Rask. So I ask you this question. If you were Bruce Cassidy or, you know, um, Dan Sweeney, whoever ended up ultimately making the decision, Cam Neely, the president, I don't know. Whoever ultimately made the decision, more likely Bruce Cassidy because he's the head coach, who would you have picked or who would you have chose to start between the pipes tonight for Game 6 in New York when you're losing the Series 3-2, when you need a win, in enemy territory, Tuka Rask or Jeremy Swayman? Reach out to me on social media. Comment down below. Give me your answer. Me personally, if Tuka Rask is 100% healthy, I'm picking Tuka. But if he's not, I don't care if he's 90% healthy. If he is not 100% healthy, I'm going Jeremy Swayman. And I understand that the risk of you know potentially ruining 
a young goalie's mindset, uh, physique, confidence, optimism, whatever. Plus, you're throwing him with little to no experience into the fire. I get it. But he's shown at times that he's capable. But since we already know that Tuka Rask is starting tonight in goal for the Bruins, in this game six, do or die, win or go home game, how long does Bruce Cassidy leave him out there? Does he keep him out there until the first goal is given, until he gives up a goal? Two goals? Does he just leave him out there no matter what? I honestly think as long as the Bruins have the lead, if they get the lead, of course, you keep him out there unless he gives up two goals. I know it's, it's just so stipulated, but these are things you need to think of. If Tuka can go two periods without giving up a goal and the Bruins have a 2 nothing lead and he gives up one goal early in the third, what is, he, what is Bruce Cassidy going to do? What would you do? What do you think he's going to do? Like These are questions that we're going to be asking ourselves throughout the entirety of the game. It's just how it is. I mean, we, we could be up 3 nothing, and he gives up a goal and Tuka could get yanked. We could be down 2 to nothing. And Tuka could get yanked. I mean, honestly, if we're down two nothing, I think Tuka should get the rug and pulled out and put in Swayman. But that's just me. You know, if it's a tie game or we're up by one and Tuka Rask lets up the second or third goal to tie the game, get him out. I'm telling you, you have to give him that short of a leash. It is a do or die win or go home game. It doesn't get any more simple than that. You need to put whoever is your best option to win the game. If that's Tuca and he's 100% healthy, then you ride with Tuca. If if Tuca's not healthy and Jeremy Swayman is, and you like what you see out of Swayman, then you put him in. It's Yes, it's a hard decision for the Bruins to make and Bruce Cassidy to make. I understand that. But you need to go into this game... With you know every potential situation, whether the score is one zero, one one, o one, two one, two two, uh, two nothing, o two, whatever. At what point do you pull Tuka Rask? I mean, I guess I could say you know if you pull him at all, but I think at some point, if it gets really bad, Tuka will get pulled. It's just a matter of when. Hopefully, he doesn't get pulled, and the Bruins end up winning four to one. Right? That'd be nice. But it's going to be a big, epic game tonight. A lot is on the line. Your entire season is on the line. And I've advocated that the Bruins are the closest Boston team to win their respective championship. Look at the Celtics. They got torched in the first round. Patriots didn't even make the playoffs last year. Obviously, going into this new year, fresh start, almost essentially a fresh new team. You're looking at the Red Sox. They sucked last year, but this year they're doing very well. Tough, hard division that it's going to be a tight race all summer long. Getting blown out by the Astros, though. So it's just a a tricky situation right now for the Bruins if they lose. You're going to disappoint a lot of Boston fans, a lot of New England fans, because you are the closest team to winning their respective championship. And if you lose to this Islanders team, who you are better than on paper and in the standings and generally speaking, not a good look. A lot of questions will be faced for the Boston Bruins, not in terms of just... uh, you know, their roster, but their goalies, potentially their head coach. You know, it's, it's going to be a long offseason for the Bruins if they can't pull this out or at least extend it to a seventh game. But I really think that they should be able to win this series. I honestly predicted, you know, Bruins in, I think it was five or six, but obviously I was clearly wrong. Islanders are a better team than I thought, which, you know, I give them the respect for. But that doesn't mean you're not a better team than them, and I really think you are. So that's going to wrap up my Bruins segment here. I hope come Friday we can talk about the Bruins extending the series to a Game 7. And if we potentially get there, that will be Friday, June 11th at 7.30. Puck drop back in Boston at the TD Garden. But I'm not going to go more into it because it only matters about tonight's Game 6 with puck drop in roughly 20 or so minutes. So I want to refer to an article from Bleacher Report. Yeah, Bleacher Report that was written by... Farbod Esnarshari. Oh, tough name, I'm sorry. And he writes about the Celtics player that wants to essentially break up with the Celtics. 
And the title of his article says, Sources say Boston Celtics and Kemba Walker want to break up. Now, a couple episodes ago, I talked about potential trades and I did the trade machine, which I did again today, revolving around Kemba. But the trades that I did or the proposed trades that I did a few episodes ago, I think one or two, I think just one uh, involved Kemba Walker. And it's going to be hard to move that contract. He is making 36 or so million next year. So it's going to be very hard to move that contract. You might have to give up a couple draft picks in order to do so because it's not going to be easy for a team to take on two years, 70 or 82, whatever million dollars he's owed. I think it's 72 left. But let me read the article. The Kemba Walker experiment in Boston seems to be coming to an end. Sources said the Boston Celtics and Walker are likely to move forward from their relationship this offseason in a mutual agreement between the parties. The once promising young, young Celtics who were so close to the NBA Finals are now in the middle of a potential blow up. Their season went so poorly that the organization decided to shake up the front office, the coaching staff, and player personnel. President of Basketball Operations Danny Ainge retired, and former head coach Brad Stevens was promoted to fill the position. Sources said the team will keep Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, but Walker will be a part of the breakup, uh, the shakeup, excuse me. And the feeling is mutual between Walker and the organization. Walker helped push the Celtics to Game 6 of the Eastern Conference Finals in 2020, but they fell short to the surprise Miami Heat run. Despite that success, Ainge was ready to move on from Walker within the point guard's first year. Sources close to the Celtics revealed Ainge sought to trade Walker and Drew Holiday was the target. Holiday ended up with the Milwaukee Bucks, who are now in the second round of the playoffs against the Brooklyn Nets. A source close to Walker said that he was hurt by Boston's efforts to trade him, which created a rift in the Ainge, uh, the Walker-Ainge relationship. Walker has a great relationship with his teammates and looked forward to being a veteran mentor to Tatum and Brown, but the same can't be said about Walker in the front office. He no longer feels wanted. One executive in the NBA said Walker isn't the player to have those negative feelings towards Ainge, as players around the league have not trusted Celtics management during the Ainge era. Perhaps the most telling public example of that reputation came when Anthony Davis's father said he would never want his son to play for the Celtics after how they handled Isaiah Thomas' injury and departure. The NBA's health and safety protocols and injuries made a big impact on the Celtics. Tatum had a serious case of COVID-19 that resulted in, an, in his needing an inhaler. Four other Celtics, four other players simultaneously dealt with the protocols, and Brown suffered a season-ending injury. Boston fell short of expectations as the East number seven seed. Um, let's see. Oh, this article is a little longer than I thought. Let me just keep going. Sit back and relax and enjoy this audible, right? Um, where was it? The COVID-19 situation was so bad that April, by April, the Celtics had lost 131 player days because of health and safety protocols that resulted in losing the Nets in five games in the first round. Walker had his moments last year, but was not healthy during the 2021 season. He missed 29 games in the regular season and the last two of the playoffs. Even when Walker, Tatum, and Brown were all on the floor, ball-stopping issue plagued the Celtics. They ranked 25th in assists per game in both 2019 and 2020. Walker is set to earn $36 million in 21-22, which will make a trade difficult. His contract expires at the end of 22-23. Uh, during which he has a player option for a $37.7 million. According to The Athletic's Jared Wise, quote, multiple front office sources across the NBA told The Athletic last week they still view Walker as having negative trade value should the team decide to go that route this offseason. That likely means a trade would cost the Celtics extra picks or assets to offload, even if Walker is universally admired for his rel relentlessly positive attitude and hard work through injury. Um, and I'm not going to go into it anymore because it gives you some potential trade options, which I have here myself. So the first potential trade involving Kemba Walker is with the Celtics, obviously, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, I did this uh, last week, I believe. It was like the Celtics, Thunder, and the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, but this, is, this one's just between the Celtics and the Thunder. Thunder have the cap space to take on Kemba's Walker straight up. So I'm sending Kemba Walker and Carson Edwards to the Oklahoma City Thunder. And in return, they're getting power forward Isaiah Roby and a 2021 20, second round pick via Minnesota and a 2022 second round pick. It kind of helps the Celtics reset their salary cap issues. It helps move from move on from Walker and Carson Edwards, who has 
done literally nothing. You get Isaiah Roby, who is a stretch big man who's on a rookie contract. He's 6'8", and it gives you another big body down there, Someone, something that you have lacked ever since you traded Daniel Tice. I like this trade. I think it's you know low risk, high reward, especially if you plan on moving Kemba Walker. This is probably the easiest way to do so. There's no trade exceptions or, or nothing of the like. You move Kemba Walker, who I guess you are mutually agreeing to part ways with, and you get to clear a bench spot with Carson Edwards getting out of here. Isaiah Roby would, I guess, could be a good role player for your bench, especially with his size and his ability as a stretch big man. Kind of like a, um, I'm trying to think. What's a good comparison for him? Um, I'm trying to think. Someone that can like pick and roll, shoot some baseline jumpers. I don't really know how well he's shooting threes. I don't really have his stats in front of me. Can I pull him up here? I can't. Well, it doesn't matter. And you also get two second-round draft picks as well, just because you're not going to get a first for Kemba Walker. Honestly, you can just get rid of the draft picks, to be honest, and I'll be okay with this trade. But I don't think that's how Brad Stevens is going to want to kind of make his first trade, trading Kemba Walker for some young Isaiah Roby kid. That's just trade number one. Trade number two is a little bit more of a big name than... uh, and Isaiah Roby, no disrespect to him, but this is something that has also kind of surfaced in Dallas where we could potentially see Kristaps Porzingis moved out from Dallas where the Mavericks look to bring in another ball handler, scorer, winger to help Luka Doncic. So I have the Celtics acquiring Kristaps Porzingis for Kemba Walker, Carson Edwards again, but you could put um, Grant Williams there. You could put Tremont Waters there. I just put Carson Edwards there. And also a 2022 first-round pick, top 10 protected. Now, the reason why that's there is because, yes, Chris Stapps is making $31.6 million, and he has three years left on his contract. You're not saving all that. I mean, you're saving a little bit of money. You're saving like six or so million dollars, all things considered. But you're also getting a young big man who has a lot of versatility and probably still a lot of room in his ceiling. He's seven, three power forward. Obviously he can play the five. He can, um, he can shoot, he can defend. And I think there's still a lot of room for him to grow as a player. I think he's someone that the Celtics need and giving up a protected first round draft pick. I mean, Carson Edwards is just a throw in because they need another guard, you know, in their, the Mavericks need another guard on their bench, obviously at this moment. But the first round draft pick is top 10 protected because Walker and Edwards for Przingis, I don't want to say is enough. You need something else there, obviously, because the Mavericks would be taking a 31-year-old, 32-year-old knee-troubling point guard. So that first round draft pick may have to be unprotected. I don't know. But the Mavericks would be able to take on all of Walker's contract if they give up Kristaps Przingis. And this is something I could see them doing, which would be very beneficial to both parties. The third and final trade that I have formulated is a little bit of a bigger one, still a two-team trade, but it has the Celtics trading Kemba Walker, Marcus Smart, and Grant Williams, and I guess on top of that, a 2022 second-round pick. And the Celtics would be acquiring John Wall, Avery Bradley on a three-year sign-and-trade extension, plus a 2022 first-round pick via Brooklyn and or Miami. Well, I guess, yeah, Brooklyn or Miami, depending on how that falls, depending on who gets it, and then that Rockets will get that pick, right? And then we'll get that pick. This is a, this is a big one. This is a big one. A lot of pieces here moving. And let me break it down. The John Wall experiment in Houston is really not going anywhere. The Rockets still suck. And are they just going to want to pay John Wall $44 million for them to suck and inevitably do nothing? I don't know. You know, John Wall was, you know, kind of rumored to go to the Celtics before the Wizards traded him. So I think a player like John Wall, who's, you know, an aging veteran, still has a little bit left in the tank and he looks really healthy. Good benefit being here in Boston where he doesn't have to be the main guy. He's a insane passer. So and that's someone that the Celtics need to be able to pass the ball to Brown Tatum and also be able to score if and when necessary. Trading Marcus Smart would just help with the cap issues because Wall is very expensive. Uh, I guess you know he has a high cap. But trading Marcus Smart is also something that has surfaced in recent news 
with one year left on his deal, around $14 million. Getting that defensive player for the Rockets is something that's very um, appealing to them because they do lack defensive ability. So you're getting an offensive player in Walker and a defensive player in Smart. Plus, you're getting Grant Williams, who's I don't want to say he's a throw-in, but he kind of is a throw-in, along with uh, that 2022 second-round pick. I mean, it's hard for the draft picks because the draft picks are such a uh, more of a GM kind of thing. Like, oh, I'll give you this if you give me that. And it's really kind of blown up, especially in football in recent years. Could there be draft picks? Sure. Could there be more? Sure. Could there be none? Sure. It just, I mean... I'm just, you know, trying to visualize it and making it as fair as possible. Does that have to be a first round pick instead of a second round pick? Maybe. But at the end of the day, you're getting two 30 year old players. I haven't even talked about Avery Bradley yet, but you're getting two 30 year old players. John Wall, big contract. Avery Bradley, a three year sign and trade deal. He could, uh, the te- Rockets could exercise his team option and just trade that. So I don't know. And that. Brooklyn or Miami pick is probably going to be relatively late in the first round anyways. So it's not like a top 10. It's not like it's the Rockets, you know, top five draft pick. So that's why that is in there as well. But the Avery Bradley thing, signing and trading for him helps bring you defense. It brings you a little bit of offense because his last couple years in Boston was really him developing himself as an offensive player. People liked him here in Boston. So bringing him back. Being a role player, someone that you don't have to play every night or matchup wise, I think makes sense. I don't want, I mean, Avery Bradley, you know, in the early 2010s was phenomenal. I mean, he was a, a, a insane defender during the waning ages of the big three. I mean, there was times the Celtics were starting him over Ray Allen because Allen was going through his ankle issues and injury issues. I think Avery Bradley back to Boston for a, for a little bit would be very welcomed. I mean, I just did a, a three year, Four and a half per million dollar deal. So what is that? Like 13 and a half or so. I mean, it's very doable. Could be less. I don't think you should pay any more than four and a half per year for a player like him. But he's just kind of thrown to kind of help balance things off. Makes things, makes the trade a little bit more fair in terms of value. So let me just repeat this one. Kemba Walker, Marcus Smart, Grant Williams in a 2022 second round pick for John Wall, Avery Bradley on a sign and trade and a 2022 first round pick via Brooklyn or Miami. That one's a little bit bigger one. Could we potentially see that? Maybe not. I would love I would love to see it, yes. But realistically, I think the Mavericks-Celtics trade with Przingis and Walker is the most realistic out of the bunch. I think the Kemba Walker to the Oklahoma City Thunder trade would probably be the easiest one if you're just like, you know, screw it, let's just get rid of them. So like I said, it's going to be a quick, fast-paced episode because I want to make sure I get this out there before the Bruins game starts, I have 10 or so minutes to, you know, roughly edit it and all that good stuff to get it out there to you, the listener. But before I go, before I wrap things up, you know, relatively abruptly, please, please, please download, listen, and enjoy as you have been. And I've been super appreciative of that. If you're watching on YouTube, please like the video if you enjoyed it. Comment down below any of your thoughts and opinions about the Bruins, the Celtics, or maybe a topic that we didn't discuss about that you would like to to be discussed about and also please hit that big giant red subscribe button if you're new or have not considered subscribing to the channel if i was very fast this episode i apologize i tried to jam in a 45 hour long episode into 30 or 5 or so minutes however long this ends up being i really appreciate all your support go bruins tonight and i cannot wait to watch the game and see how it plays out hopefully 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 come friday's episode we can talk about game seven and not an exit. Yeah, yeah, not an exit episode for the Bruins. <sighs> do or die. Win or go home. I have all the faith in the world in this team that they'll do it. And I hope you do too. But between now and Friday's episode, when I get back to you, enjoy the game. Enjoy the next couple of days. But like I said, between now and then, you know that I love you and you know that I will always see you.